I consider myself fortunate that my time at the Poetry Room has coincided with the creation of the first biography of John Ashbery and with frequent visits to Houghton Library by Ashbery's biographer, Karen Rothman. In the course of her rigorous research, Rothman has created not simply a text, but a textile, a beneficent fabric of lives, a vital reunion of selves. She has restored a kind of civic fervor, an inclusive care to the task of the biographer. In his great poem, Pyrography, which I've quoted once before, John Ashbury writes, if we were going to be able to write the history of our time, starting with today, it would be necessary to model all these unimportant details so as to be able to include them. Otherwise, the narrative would have that flat sandpapered look the sky gets out in the Middle West toward the end of summer. And not just the major events, but the whole incredible mass of everything happening simultaneously and pairing off, channeling itself into history. Rothman has modeled that kind of comprehensive flowchart. For her, the biography of Ashbery's youth has become a means and not an end, a means of renewing the kinds of uncanny friendships, affections, felicities, humors, delights, ideas, details, and surprises one finds in the work of Ashbery himself, and extending that across a field, not simply of words, but of actions, actions taken extracurricularly on his behalf. What the blurbs won't tell you is that in addition to her meticulous archival research and unstinting fact-checking, Rothman has steadfastly dedicated herself to helping John and David Kermani preserve their beloved adoptive home in upstate New York and its contents. She has received a Digital Humanities Lab grant for John Ashbury's Nest, a digital study center and virtual tour of Ashbury's Hudson House. She has taught for and contributed time and energy to the now thriving Ashbury Home School and has joyfully reconnected friends and acquaintances from John's youth, reviving vibrant lines of affiliation. And so it comes as no surprise that she was able to recover and reunite with its actors the long-lost film we will be showing tonight, Presenting Jane, and that she has written so fully and feelingly of the time period in which the friendships within it emerged. Please welcome Karen Rothman, who joins us tonight from Yale. <laughs> Oh, thanks so much for being here. Um, I'm excited to see this. I just saw it for the first time on a big screen. Um, I just want to say a few words before we show it. First of all, I want to thank Christina Davis, who in 2013, when I called her up and said that I had found this film, and did she think that Harvard might want to preserve it because it was in a tin and smelled like vinegar and bananas, apparently, and it was not not in good shape at all. Um, and she said, absolutely, and she found a great collaboration with Hayden Guest and Liz Coffey at the Harvard Film Archive, and i um, very grateful to all of them for preserving this, as you'll see, very brief, um, but very lovely film. So what we're going to show you now, is it, it's 11 minutes. Um, it's a four and a half minute, or not even quite four and a half minute film, um, and then the six and a half minute outtakes um, that that were saved also. And what, what we did on May 9th, as you'll hear, uh, Christina Davis uh, gives a kind of introduction in the film. But um, on May 9th, we showed the film and the outtakes to John Ashbery, Jane Freilicker, and Harrison Starr, who was the cameraman and uh, co-director um, in John Ashbery's apartment. And so you'll see them watching the film, and also you'll hear them talking over the film. The film has no sound. They were planning to add either, nobody's quite sure, either uh, they were going to add the script of James Schuyler's original script and have it be, have them talk over the images, um, or they were going to provide some music. Nobody's sure. Um, so, so right now it's without sound, and the sound that you hear is, is from May 9th when we were discussing it as we were watching it. All right, so here it is. On May 9, 2014, 
John Ashbery, Jane Freilicker, Harrison Starr, and several scholars and friends gathered in Ashbery's Chelsea apartment to watch, reminisce, and reflect on the film Presenting Jane. Filmed in 1952, Presenting Jane was presumed lost for over 60 years until it was rediscovered through the critical assistance of Ashbery's biographer Karen Rothman in 2013. Harrison Starr, who directed the film, generously donated the fragile reels and outtakes to the Woodbury Poetry Room and the Harvard Film Archive. After several months of preservation work, the Poetry Room invited the surviving participants to experience the film for the first time since its premiere in Greenwich Village in 1953, and to shed light on the circumstances around the film's creation. As a grand finale, the original actors and director agreed to do an impromptu read-through of the silent film's intended script, written by James Schuyler and recently rediscovered by Nathan Kernan. The Poetry Room wishes to thank David Kermani and John Ashbery for opening their home to us, and Harrison Starr for allowing us to present and represent the remarkable Jane. John, can you see? Do you remember that plank? <laughs> no. It was just a plank just a, two inches below the water. They're the boys. Yeah, the boathouse. Mike Kanemitsu and Lenore Pettit's house. What do you think, Jane? Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to watch the outtakes? Uh, sure, let's watch the outtakes. Okay. Okay, teacher. <laughs> when was that? Nineteen fifty-two. Oy, oy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fifty-two. Yeah. Yep, summer. I think it was a fir my first trip to the Hamptons ever. Courtesy of John Latouche. Is he in any of the footage? John, yeah. no. That looks like the car Joe used to have. <laughs> I guess all cars that looked like that. <laughs> no, no, it was distinct. That was a Buick, Buick convertible. It was a big deal after yeah. the Second World War. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Is that Joe's car? The automatic windows are played for full effect. <laughs> automatic windows and even something more, you'll notice, yeah. that General Motors is proud to promote, yeah. and that is, watch the top. <laughs> The top would fold back. Frank undoes it, then it folds back automatically. And that was a major yeah. event in convertibles. Was that John Latouche's car? No, I don't think so. I've forgotten whose car it was. It must have been Joe's. Was it? It must be, because there are other pictures of Joe. I'm sorry? There are other pictures of the convertible that you guys have. I mean, we oh, had it was there. 
Be careful, Eric, you're going to get a mic outage. I don't know if this is that car. Yeah. It happen later. There, there's a convertible top, automatic. Who's in the back? That's that Frank. Frank. Yeah. And Jimmy in the back seat. Yep, yep. Frank was driving. <laughs> Jesus. And that's um, the man in the great, the gray seersucker suit. <laughs> <laughs> the gray flannel suit. <laughs> We're all puffing on cigarettes. Indeed. Not me. No, you didn't, Jane. Whatever all the rest of us smoked with the damn fools that we were. <laughs> sort of like the movie Ballet Mécanique. <laughs> that everything's sort of repeating. I haven't <laughs> seen that in a hundred years. Yeah, I haven't either. Ballet Mechanic. Right? No, I haven't since about the time of this movie. Yeah. <laughs> they were just beginning to show the French avant-garde. Mm -hmm. It's like all these guys are peeing on them. <laughs> What? <laughs> we'll look like we're peeing on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> That's what you were doing. No. <laughs> but that's driven, right? Mm-hmm. Forgot yeah. how good looking he was. You were all good looking. Yeah. You know. You know. Handsome youth. How much we thought we knew and how little we knew. Quite mysterious, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> like, a a mystery. very mysterious. The well, you'll yeah, see. What's happening? <laughs> trying to present you. <laughs> I think that got lost in the shuffle. <laughs> no, you wait, wait. These are outtakes, remember. Is that me on the right. That person there. This is the full cast. Yep. Yeah. What? Just coming up with theories on that slide here. We come around, you'll see, and shoot from this angle, and then we move in an extreme close up on you. <laughs> Do you know what book that was, John? Yeah that you're ripping pages out of? What? Do you know what book it was that you were ripping pages out of? No. No? It's pretty I, thick. Yeah. I think it was an early Joyce Carol Oates. <laughs> <laughs> it does, it doesn't. Oh, I love this scene. Yeah, yeah, it's good. And then we come around. <laughs> what? Don't laugh. It's a big old Jane Come Proctor on. Attitude. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh. What am I complaining about? <laughs> <laughs> Fickle.
I think Frank was writing Hatred that summer. Hmm. I think Frank was writing Hatred that summer. That summer? Yeah. That looks like what he was writing. <laughs> 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 He was always uh, chiping busily away and w with people around like that. <laughs> Pretty good for two fingers. Is he really only? Pretty much. <laughs> what were we supposed to be doing? <laughs> I really wish we could answer that. Hmm. I was svelte once. <laughs> there. I wanted to get your eyes, but I didn't have any fill. So it's a sharp contrast. There, that's what I wanted. That's a beautiful shot of you, Jane. Yes. <laughs> Was it me? <laughs> God, Jane, you're impossible. <laughs> Come on, we'll roll back and you'll have to look at it again and again okay. and again, all right? No, I'm really thrilled. Yeah, I'll <laughs> bet. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's the film and the outtakes. Um, they're brief and charming, kind of lovely. Um, and I, I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes now about the context for what was happening around the filming of it. And, um, and well, I'll talk for about 10 minutes about that, and then I'll read a short excerpt from the book, um, which is about the weekend that they made the film, and, um, and then talk a little bit about the script. And then uh, the last thing we'll do is show you um, the, uh, just a brief part of the oral history where they read a piece of Schuyler's script. Um, but let me see if I can. Um, so, two aspects of the film that I think make it worth seeing uh, <laughs> in 64 years after it was first made. Um, it offers a picture of the shared beginnings of a group of artists who later took very distinct aesthetic paths. And it also marks the sh start of a shift in setting for these artists from New York City to the Hamptons. The Hamptons is where this was filmed. Um, from urban to pastoral, a landscape that became extremely important in the subsequent works of this group of poets and painters. Um, the Hamptons became as important as the city already was. So about 10 years after this film was made, John Bernard Myers coined the term New York School Poets or the S Poets of the New York School um, to describe collectively the work of 18 poets and painters, including Kenneth Koch, John Ashbery, Frank O'Hara, Barbara Guest, James Schuyler, Jane Freilicher and Fairfield Porter, artists whose first chapbooks he had published at the Tibor Dinaj Gallery, who were deeply connected to New York City, who had particularly close collaborations and friendships with painters, and who he and others claimed shared both, quote, an ironic sensibility and an unease with pretentiousness. These were the things that he felt linked them. Um, in the years since that pronouncement, though writers, especially Ashbery, um, have really resisted this moniker, arguing that their works were much too different to ever be lumped together in such a way. The film, though, um, suggests some aspects of an aesthetic outlook that this group of distinct artists really did share, especially at this early moment in their artistic lives. Um, and they believed, I think, that the experience of being with and around friends produces the best conditions for creativity. Uh, they thought that the, some parts of creation always remain and should remain engagingly mysterious. And they also felt that humor and silliness are part of, not separate from, one serious devotion to art. For Ashbury, these three ideas um, 
being around friends, the mysteriousness of creation, and uh, the importance of humor and, and silliness, even within um, a serious devotion to art, were actually quite new. And he had come to rely on them, especially in the seven year period between his graduation from, from Harvard here um, in 1949 and uh, through the publication of his first book, Some Trees, in 1956. At that point, he moved to France, and he began to think a little bit differently about the ideal conditions for the creation of art. But in these early years, thinking about art as closely connected with friendship, mystery, sil silliness, and seriousness, char characteristics embodied by these four friends that are on screen um, were, were so important to his artistic and personal development. And he developed the, these ideas alongside his new friends, especially Kenneth Koch, who wasn't in the film, but I'll get to in a little bit, Jane Freilicher and Frank O'Hara, especially. Um, one of the ways that the history of the New York School Poets has repeatedly been told is as a story of collaborations and friendships and influences. And one of the ways that story has been framed is through the myth that developed around this particular film, over the, especially over the 60 years it was missing, um, in large part because people who had been involved in its creation remember and talked about um, it as a visual example of a powerful group dynamic. Um, here was a film, they said, that showed how this group of male poets both shared and honored their muse, the painter Jane Freilicher. So the part of the film that was remembered and talked about in interviews was that last shot of, in the film of Jane walking on water. Um, it's a very beautiful shot and memorable, and, and the people involved in the film also really remembered how long it took Harrison and his assistant Harry Martin to bury the planks in the water so that, she, so that it would look like she was walking on it. Um, one of the most interesting parts of writing this book, though, I must say, has been to look very, very closely at how these friendships actually started and what they were actually like at the point at which they made this film. So when people talk about the film, it's about friendships that had already formed, but in fact, they were really quite, quite new at this moment. So um, to, to, I wanna talk a little bit about the, the forming of these friendships um, by starting with a letter that Ashbery wrote in 1950 in September. This is two years before this short film was made and John Ashbery wrote in a letter to Jane Freilicher, quote, I am constantly plotting how to spend most of my life amid friends. Um, when he wrote the comment, he was primarily thinking about one important new friend, which was Frank O'Hara. They had met one year earlier in May 1949, which was the final month of John Ashbery's um, senior year at Harvard. And it was O'Hara's junior year at Harvard. O'Hara was older than Ashbery, but because he'd been in the Navy, he was actually a year behind him in college. So they, they became such close friends in that one month that Ashbery wrote to a friend of his that Frank had become not only a brother, but nearly, quote, an identical twin. Right after Ashbery's graduation, though, they parted. O'Hara had to spend the summer at home in Grafton, Massachusetts, and Ashbery drove home with his parents um, to his family farm in upstate New York with plans to go to New York. He was only gonna stay at home for two weeks, and then he was gonna move to New York where he'd been planning to live since he was a kid. Um, so during Ashbery's first hour in New York City, really the, his first hour, he met Jane Freilicher. Um, so this meeting came about because of Kenneth Koch. So Kenneth Koch was also a Harvard student, two years older than Ashbery, and he, so he had graduated in 48. He knew Frank O'Hara just a little bit. They weren't friends here. And he and Ashbery became very good friends uh, when they worked together on the Harvard Advocate, um, which started back up after a war hiatus in um, 1947. So he graduated, Koch graduated in 1948, so he moved already to New York City. He was living in a building on 16th and 3rd, and his downstairs neighbor was Jane Freilicher. So that's how Kenneth Koch met, met Freilicher. And uh, so Kenneth Koch was going home to Cincinnati with his parents in July 1949 when John Ashbery was going to New York City to start his life um, in the city and offered his key and his apartment to sublet for a couple of weeks and left the key with Jane Freilicher and that's how they met. Um, John Ashbery went to get the key. And there was another person who was supposed to be living in that building who was ill. And so Jane Freilicher and John Ashbery were the only people in this like four-story tenement building um, 
for the sum for, for most of the summer. And they became such good friends that they became pretty much siblings by the end of that summer. Um, and through Jane Freilicher, Ashbery met other poets and painters. It was through Jane that he was introduced to Larry Rivers, Al Kresh, Nell Blaine, Edwin Denby, Rudy Burkhart, and all became part of Ashbery's larger circle beginning that summer of 1949. So Ash uh, O'Hara, in the meantime, is going back to his senior year at, at Harvard, 1949-1950, and he visits Ashbery a few times during the year in New York City, and he meets Jane Freilicher, um, through, those, through those visits to New York City. But by the summer of, of 1950, Ashbery had on the one hand this really rich New York City life that he loved in terms of his friendships, but he was also really unhappy. He wasn't writing very much. He was in a master's program at Columbia that he, in literature that he didn't like very much at all, and he really wasn't sure what to do. He had no money, so he went home for the summer in the summer of 1950, he's again on the farm, at his parents' farm, unhappy, um, really unsure about, about the future, as one is often at, <laughs> at the age of um, 23, which is what he turned that summer. And he really missed Frank O'Hara and went to visit him that summer. O'Hara had graduated uh, from Harvard in the meantime, was renting an apartment in Cambridge. And so John Ashbury went to visit they spent a week in Cambridge, discussed living in Cambridge, discussed moving to Boston, and also discussed the idea that maybe they'd both get this awesome fellowship to University of Michigan graduate writing program. Um, and they discussed this and they both applied. Um, so on September 9th, when John Ashbury is writing to Jane Freilicher, I hope to spend my life amid, with, amid my friends, he's really thinking, I really hope I get into University of Michigan graduate writing program with Frank O'Hara, since graduate admissions, I guess, let people know much, much later <laughs> at that point. Um, and, and he's worried. Uh, he hasn't heard, and he's still on the farm wondering where he should go next. So he doesn't get in. O'Hara does get in. And he's faced with another year where he doesn't know what to do. He decides to go back to New York City um, and re-enroll at Columbia, Columbia, even though he didn't uh, want, really want to. So um, Ashbury's back in New York City, and um, a lot of people are not in New York City. Jane Freiliger's still there, but Kenneth Koch has now gotten a Fulbright and moved to Paris. Um, Nell Blaine and Larry Rivers are traveling around Europe. Um, Ashbury and Freilicher begin to feel particularly isolated in New York City, even though it's the place that they wanted to be. But a new gallery was opening up um, in December 1950. The first show at the T. Board Nanage Gallery uh, opened, and they became really good friends with John Bernard Meyer, who was beginning to position himself as a kind of impresario of 1950s New York art scene. Each exhibition at the Tibor Dinaj was up for about six weeks. And the guest book, which survives from those early years at Tibor Dinaj, is an absolutely extraordinary document of names and addresses of famous artists, now famous artists and writers who were going through every single exhibition. Um, and he, Myers, although he was known as a kind of difficult person, he really liked connecting people. So. Um, one of the people who asked him for a, a connection is James Schuyler, who wasn't living in New York City yet, but knew, knew uh, Myers from their time in Buffalo together. Um, and he, at this time, James Schuyler is not yet a poet. He's writing only short stories. And he, ha he reads a poem by this young person named Frank O'Hara in Accent Magazine and asks uh, Myers if uh, he knows him. And he does. Um, although Frank O'Hara is still in Michigan, he's come to New York City, he's met Myers, and Myers promises to put them in touch. But they don't actually meet until the fall of the following, of the following year, fall of 1951, is when James Schuyler finally meets um, Frank O'Hara and John Ashbery. But in the meantime, um, in the spring of 1951, uh, Ashbery writes The Picture of Little J.A. in A Prospect of Flowers, which is a remarkable poem, and, a, and it was a remarkable jump um, in terms of what he was trying to do at the time. And at the same time that he is writing The Picture of J.A. in A Prospect of Flowers, 
Jane Freilicher, who's experimenting and trying to find her own um, style, paints this, which is called, she calls Young Girl with Flowers. And the, the two, uh, the poem and the painting are really in a kind of intellectual communion, I think. Um, Jane Freilicher, I mean, in this, in this it's, it's her as a 13-year-old kind of thinking about, I think, on the one hand, flowers are going to become the central subject of her future painting, and she's sort of looking away from them and sort of thinking about what the subject of her painting is going to be. She's still at this point painting abstracts and landscapes and portraits and self-portraits, um, and she's really not sure yet at this point where her painting is headed. Um, Frank O'Hara graduates from Michigan and invites Jane Freilicher to come to Ann Arbor before he moves away. And that summer, um, she goes and he uses some of the money that he's won uh, from winning the uh, writing award um, to pay her to paint this, um, which is her painting of Frank O'Hara that she made the summer of 1951. And that's the doorway of his apartment in Ann Arbor. And he begins a series of Jane poems. They go together to the Art Institute of Chicago. They have this a, a kind of wonderful, tremendous trip. And when I interviewed Jane Freiliger a few years ago, she said that that was the that was kind of the peak of their relationship in in some way that summer, um, when of being inspired by each other. So she paints this, and he uh, starts writing Jane poems at. Interior with Jane, a sonnet with Jane Freilicher, Jane Awake, Jane at 12, Shay Jane. Um, and it's shortly after this trip that O'Hara finally decides to move to New York City. So the fall of 1951, Schuyler's biographer, Nathan Kernan, dates this um, meeting as October 1st, 1951, which was the opening of Larry River's first show at Tibor Dinaj Gallery. Um, Schuyler meets Ashbury, he meets O'Hara, and um, and it's good enough meeting so that they all remember it later, but they uh, don't become friends yet, in part because Schuyler is ill and suffers a mental breakdown and is hospitalized for the next few months. Um, and he writes, during that hospitalization, he writes Salute, his first poem, uh, and I recommend highly the essay that Nathan Kernan has written about the creation of this first poem. Um, so we're now at the winter of 1952, and a healthier Schuyler goes to see John Myers to try to figure out what to do, and Myers suggests that he helps Jane Freilicher frame her paintings, that she's about to have her first show at the Tibor Dinaj Gallery, and, uh, and that she's trying to figure out which paintings to use and, and also to frame them. And, Schuyler had had some experience doing this, so he, he does this. And he helps Jane, and he starts to become friends with her at this very momentous and anxious moment for her as she prepared for the first public presentation of her work. Um, and he observes her. Schuyler observes her among her new friends, especially Ashbury and O'Hara, who are in the process of becoming his friends, too. And he thinks a lot about who each one is as a person and as an artist and how they interact. And by the time her exhibition opens on May 6, 1952, he's already written a three-character play called Presenting Jane Freilicher with three characters named John, Jane, and Frank. So Freilicher's first show was modestly well-received, and it was reviewed in, an art news, in Art News in a blurb written by Fairfield Porter, who had just taken a new job as a, um, as a reviewer. Um, none of them knew him at that point. And Porter writes about Jane's uh, debut, quote, her models include, along with the outside world, art and herself. These paintings are broad and bright, considered without being fussy, thoughtful, but never pedantic. And he follows the publication of the review with an invitation for her to come to see him at his home in Southampton. And she brings John Ashbery in a different interview, not the one um, here he says, I think that, that when we went out to make the film, that was the first time I ever been out to the Hamptons. But in a different interview, he talks about this, this other trip to the Hamptons, um, which only happened a couple weeks before this film was, was made, where they go to see um, Fairfield Porter. And right after that, that uh, trip, Fairfield writes a letter um, and says that his aunt has nicknamed this new group of kids 
the, the Dinaj children, <laughs> um, a name that suggests, I think, that she saw them as young and sibling-like and part of a single family. And already the myth of this group as a close-knit one with re related interests and attitudes is developing. Um, but really, as you know, I've been, been suggesting, none of them knew each other very long as of yet, and they didn't know each other that well yet either um, when, they, when they arrived in the Hamptons a month later to make this film. So I'm just gonna read then a short excerpt from the book, which is about the making of the film. Um, it's from chapter nine, and <laughs> chapter nine's called Greetings, Friends, which is a poem that, um, that Ashbery writes, a, a kind of funny poem he writes. Among New York City artists, there was developing interest in this small group of friends that spring of 1952. Frank devoted time to the club, an artist group founded by, among others, the sculptor Philip Pavia. Its original members, primarily abstract expressionist painters, held lectures, panel discussions, and informal meals and meetings once or twice a week, usually at 39 East 8th Street. John rarely attended, but Frank asked him especially to participate in a panel he was putting together moderated by Larry Rivers, whose artistic success was very quickly surpassing his friends. He also asked Jimmy Schuyler and the, poet, the poets Jimmy Schuyler and Barbara Guest, whom Ashbery had recently befriended after reading and being impressed by her poems in Partisan Review. Ashbery wrote a new painterly poem for the occasion called Two Scenes to read. Shortly after, O'Hara and Ashbery were invited to read their poems at the penthouse apartment of 37-year-old Broadway lyricist John Latouche, John Myers' new friend. Latouche lived with Kenward Elmsley, a wealthy young poet who was Joseph Pulitzer's grandson, who was a Harvard graduate, class of 1950, also from Dunster House, um, though he and John Ashbery had only a passing acquaintance there. O'Hara read Easter, which impressed most of the crowd. Ashbery read The Young Son, and he, in his newest poem, A Parodic Manifesto of Masculinity, every line began with he. An example is, he is now over, over proud of his Etruscan appearance. Elmsley liked the witty list, but he could not pinpoint its tone, particularly because of Ashbery's droll delivery. At the reception after the reading, Latouche suggested they all make a short film together with his new independent film company. Schuyler's play, now more modestly called Presenting Jane, at Freilicher's Rye suggestion, was offered. Latouche asked his friend, the avant-garde filmmaker Maya Darren, to shoot the film, but she declined and recommended her boyfriend, Harrison Starr, a highly intelligent but hot-headed young cameraman who just had just finished filming her short film, The Very Eye of Night, which rendered movement and dance in a very avant-garde surrealist style. Harrison met with John, Jimmy, and Frank, whom he especially liked, at a hotel lobby near MoMA one afternoon. Jane couldn't be there, and he agreed to make the film with them. Privately, though, he thought Schuyler's script was terrible. <laughs> Another friend of Latouche's, Lenora Pettit, offered to lend her East Hampton home on Georgia Capon for filming. By early July, a large group began assembling at the house. Latouche picked up his star, Jane Freilicher, in his convertible at two in the morning, which he found, quote, exotic and a little crazy, and he drove her out. John, Frank, Jimmy, John Myers, Kenward Elmsley, Harrison Starr, and his assistant, Harry Martin, had already arrived earlier at the house, which was messy and overrun by too many wildly divergent personalities at close quarters. Larry Rivers was living next door, having recently been hired by Leo Castelli to make a sculpture for his home. He began to stop by frequently to see everyone, which irritated Harrison, who was very serious and intent on planning each shot of the film. Larry ignored Harrison's requests for quiet and got louder and stayed longer. As Harrison's temper flared, aggravated by unusually rainy and unstable summer weather, a tiny budget, and the insouciant attitude of almost everyone else involved in the film, he and Larry nearly got into a fist fight, and he threw Larry out of the house. One of the problems Harrison was struggling with was the original script's lack of story. It consisted of many speeches that amounted to a series of insightful character sketches without any overarching link. But just before filming, Harrison and Jimmy worked out a scenario where Schuyler would portray a silent observer, watching two writers, played by John and Frank, and an artist with godlike powers, played by Jane. For the final shot of the film, 
Harrison wanted Jane to rise from the water and then walk on it, Christ-like. He and his assistant spent hours hiding, hiding wooden planks underneath the surface of the pond. He planned to shoot her falling backwards into the water and then reverse the image so it would seem in the final cut as though she rose out of it. And that one piece of her falling back, we can't find it. It's lost somewhere. While the small crew meticulously plotted and set up each shot by the pond, the poets wrote inside. Jane observed her friends who were tireless workers, quote, and capable of concentrating amid chaos. They would spill out these poems. They were so spontaneous. John seemed to find ideas everywhere, quote, as though his mind were combing the universe and grabbing whatever it needed. Jimmy, four years older than John, remained slightly distant from the rest, quote, original and very independent. During the weekend, Kenneth Koch arrived, having been away for two years. Kenneth and Frank, who had crossed paths only rarely, began to collaborate on a sestina as a way of becoming friendly. For, <laughs> for Kenneth, it was, quote, the first time he wrote a poem with somebody else, and, quote, also the first time I had ever been able to write a good sestina, an engrossing and intensely fun project which made the others jealous. Kenneth also played tennis with Leo Castelli's daughter, Nina, provoking Larry to brand him an unlikable social climber. Kenneth, Frank, and John had a way of talking that made Jimmy, who was the only poet not from Harvard, feel excluded. They were jealous of him. Jimmy's new poem, At the Beach, had appeared that week, the July 5th issue of The New Yorker, and they made snide asides about the kinds of poems the magazine accepted. John felt snubbed by Frank, who was paying more attention to everyone else. He became so angry one night, feeling socially excluded, that he, quote, dropped a few plates on the floor while doing dishes. So that's the, that's the end of the excerpt. Um, but I, I guess I just want to add to that then that the intensity and competitiveness of that long weekend, I think, really motivated the writers to take on some new work. So Ashbury and Schuyler began their novel, The Nest of Ninnies, and Harrison's Car, on the way back to New York City. In part, they wanted to collaborate because they had watched Coke and O'Hara collaborate so successfully on that Sestina. Um, individually, their poems shifted as well. O'Hara was working, really started working at that point on hatred. Freilicher painted uh, Georgica Pond, and then her painting started to become increasingly empty of people. Um, so in the next year or so, uh, you can see what she's actually known for now, which are interiors and exteriors, but devoid of people with flowers and buildings, but, but not, not usually with people. And then also um, the Hamptons. Um, she's known best for now our views of New York City, of Watermill, um, out her studio window. And these only began right after the, this, uh, this film in, in late 1952 and 1953. Ashbery started writing increasingly dark and funny poems, including Pantoum and The Thinnest Shadow. By early 1953, he was really pushing himself to experiment with language in ways that we associate actually with his book, The Tennis Court Oath, which was published in 1962, but that actually he was, he was doing very seriously a decade earlier. And, and while the period of filming didn't change the directions that the artists, I think, were going to get to, I think it speeded up the time in which it took, in, in which they were able to, to get there. Um, so some of the continuing interest in, in the film among scholars of the New York School comes, I think, from the fact that it was missing for so long. Um, it was screened only once, and here's the program, the one time it was screened. Um, it was February 25th, 1953. I looked for this for a really long time um, and found it in the, in, in the oddest place in Grace Hardigan's papers. She, she was the only one that kept uh, the program. But after the screening, Harrison Starr, who had had creative differences with John Latouche, packed up the film not long after he moved to California, put the tin with the film in it into his garage and left it there until the day that I called to see if you might have it. <laughs> there it was. Um, so, what? Oh, sorry. Um, so, so I think we're going to just show a little bit of the oral history now. Um, uh, just a, a tiny bit of the, of the group reading this, the script. Um, and I mentioned the, the script before. Um, Schuyler had only known them for two months when he, when he wrote it. But the script is pretty insightful about their personalities. 
Um, and I just want to read you a little bit from the beginning of the script because we're going to watch the very end of it. Um, so the first thing that Jane says is, I am filled with fear like a taxi. Um, <laughs> and then John says, she is drinking the hottest cup of coffee in the world. Frank says, I rinse lilacs to praise her brushwork. Which, and then Jane says, oh dear, I'm not bitchy enough to go far, oh dear. I long for an affair with Piera della Fra Francesca. Together we would make big things, oh dear, he's dead. And John says, in Sodas Land, a saying goes, all a woman wants of life is life. And those are the opening, that's the opening dialogue. So I think Schuyler was affectionately parodying Jane's darkly funny, brooding anxieties about her painting career, Frank's attentiveness to painting and painters and his charm, and John's obsession with Sodas, which was the tiny rural village where he had grown up on a farm, and it, he thought about it as a kind of mythic land of strange and deeply ordinary wisdom and pain. Um, since the script, which is about 10 typed pages, takes quite a while to read, um, we're just going to look at the, um, it's actually a minute and a half, uh, the ending. And it was Nathan Schuyler, James Schuyler's um, biographer, who found the script. It was actually, he calls it hiding in plain sight. I mean, it was in the Berg collection, um, just in a, not linked to anything. So nobody had ever thought to look there. Um, and this, the script's combination of strangeness and intimacy is what makes it especially worth returning to, both as a record of friendship and as the first step in the complicated process each of these artists participated in as they tried, while in each other's company, to identify precisely what set them apart from one another. So let me show you now, if I can get there, um, the, this little piece. I think I'll change my name to Jack Easter. Errors. Upstairs. Downstairs. Scotch. Rye. Stoffers. Shrafts. Virginia. Dare. Bats in the Belfry. Crabs in the Crotch. Mercedes McCambridge. Toby Wing. <laughs> Sex. Socks. Hi. You. Mm-hmm. They call they her the, the Whoopi Girl. The Whoopi Girl. Right. I am, I am the whoopee girl. The Venetian, the Venetian glass, glass bead stringer. I am a per pearl of price. Jelini's dish. dish. I am what gels the jelly. No, no albatross, albatross she. she. Modesty is my middle name, Jane Modesty Veronica. <laughs> but if you care to say a few words in my def in my, to my pictures. What were we talking about? Jane? <laughs> <laughs> who were the people reading the script who weren't John Ashbery and Jane Frothiger? So Harrison Starr, the person who had the film, the cameraman and the co-director, he played Frank O'Hara's part. Yeah, I should have said that. <laughs> who were the other people to the left of the screen? So. The person right next to Harrison was me. And, <laughs> and then in the room was also Nathan Schuyler, um, James Schuyler's biographer. Eric Brown was there, who's the, the current director of the Tibor Dinaj Gallery. And Christina was there. And uh, David Cromani was also there, but he wasn't on camera, um, who's uh, John's partner. The, uh, the film reminds me a bit of, um, you know, Louis Bunnell and maybe a Chien Andalou and some of that. Did they ever mention sort of those influences just sitting around and drinking tea and what they did? Did they mention film and how they wanted to sort of adapt film to capture, you know, some of that sense of what was going on in 52 and 53? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. So. Certain, Harrison was studying film and was very, very seriously thinking about it. But, but Frank and John were actually, they, they would send quotations from films, especially French films, um, to each other and little pictures that they would cut out from the newspaper 
that I, it took me a long time to figure out that some of them were actually images from films um, that, they would, that they would send to each other. Uh, and, and Skylar too, they, they would, um, they had that kind of interchange and it was always really, really tiny references that they themselves knew um, either because they'd gone to see films together. I mean, when once Frank O'Hara moved to New York City, he and John Ashbery went to films almost nightly. I mean, they went to see everything. Um, and uh, especially, um, well, I guess, when did Orpheus come out? Was that 1950? Um, they, they saw that, I don't know, half a dozen times. Mm. Well, thanks so much.